morning, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk. My talk today is kind of a follow-on from the opening talk yesterday. Uh, hopefully, most of you saw Aaron Dignan's talk about the new way that companies are structured. My talk is going to be more specific, talking uh, in many ways about what it was really like to be inside one of these companies and what it was like to be at Netflix. So I'm going to start with how I joined Netflix and uh, what it was like, what the process was like. So I was at Sun Microsystems for 16 years. I was a distinguished engineer there. I wrote books on performance, capacity planning, and, and built some uh, very scalable systems testing. Um, when I left, I joined eBay. And eBay was interesting at the time. It was a company I'd worked with. Um, but I found that eBay had a very hierarchical management structure. And one of the things that, um, that I found, for example, was that uh, I knew the, the chief operating officer, Maynard Webb, and I knew him personally. And when I joined the company, I sent him an email, and he helped me join the company. But when I was in the company, I was, uh, it was a, f a violation of protocol to have a regular one-on-one -on -one with him, because he was two, levels, too many levels of management further up. So that was, that was one, one interesting thing about eBay. The other was that uh, while I was at eBay, they decided that they weren't innovating fast enough. So they said, well, we should form a research lab. And I helped. I was one of the first people to join their research lab. And so how, how many people here have research labs or work for a research lab? Is something reasonably common? So does the research lab a sign of a very innovative company? Or is it the sign of a company that wants to be innovative? <laughs> but maybe it isn't quite. <laughs> so and that's what I found. One of the problems at eBay was they created a research lab. And then the research lab became um, kind of the object of some jealousy from the rest of engineering. Oh, we're not allowed to innovate because that's what the research lab does. And so they started building projects that competed with the research lab projects. And when the research lab finished something that was interesting, they weren't very interested in taking it to production. So you get conflict by making a small group of people special. So that, that, was, that didn't work that well. And I was you know, working within this environment for um, a year or two. And then I decided that I wanted to find something else to do. And Actually, uh, going back to the, the, the talk that was just on, this was in 2006, 2007. And on this, in my spare time, I was trying to develop applications for mobile phones. Just as sort of a spare time interest, it was not really anything to do with eBay. Um, we had a little project within the labs. But, and, and the group of us decided to build a homebrew mobile phone, like design it ourselves, build the things, and I used a 3D printer to print the case for this mobile phone because that was the piece of the project I worked on. And we, it didn't quite work, and it, we were trying to make it work, and then Apple announced the iPhone and went, okay, we give up. This is what we were actually wanted. It was a, a programmable computer with a nice touch screen and lots of cap capacity. So we gave up trying to build our own iPhone. I still have bits of it in a bag somewhere. Um, but that, that was kind of the, the things that I was playing around with at the time. So I got a call from Netflix, and they said, you know, come and interview with us. We're, we're just launching streaming. And I knew Netflix as a DVD shipping company. I, they were nearby where I worked. In fact, they're five miles from eBay. The, the, the offices are a few miles apart. They have almost exactly the same technology stack. Same you know, as Java, Oracle, a big system and a data center. Um, and a similar kind of release processes and things like that. But the company, um, when I was interviewing, they were trying to explain the culture to me. And it was difficult. We spent a lot of time trying, trying to explain what is it that is different. And it sounded like his crazy ideas, a lot of crazy ideas that were very novel. And one of the reasons I joined Netflix was because I wanted to see if these ideas really worked. If they really worked, I wanted to get inside them and figure out how they worked. If they didn't work, OK, I could try this job and find, move on again. Right? It was still a good job. But that, that, was the, that was the time I joined. And what Netflix was doing right then was trying to hire people, the best people it could find anywhere that would help them with scalability and distributed systems and building highly available services. Because what they had was a product which involved shipping disks. 
shipping DVDs. And you interacted with it by sending the DVD back, and the next day another DVD would come. Right? So it wasn't really an online, it was an online website, but it wasn't, didn't really have to stay up all the time. It was mostly about the DVDs. When you go to streaming, there's a different problem. Think about the number of times you interact with the website for DVD shipping. Maybe once a week you say, I want these orders, the, the movie this to come in this order. And then you leave it, and that's it. When you're doing streaming, uh, you visit the site continuously, and you're watching the movie, and it's continuously re sending messages back and forth to, con to monitor the experience and to control it. And it turns out for every customer that is streaming a movie, it's maybe a 1,000 times more interactions with the back-end website and APIs than a DVD customer. So when 0.1% of your customer base is streaming, it's 50-50 in your data center. Right? So they kind of understood that at that time, but this was interesting because we had a good growth rate on DVD, but on any axis, the growth rate on streaming was almost a vertical line <laughs> on the same graph. You couldn't draw the lines. One was flat and one was, it was 90 degrees apart because this line is a thousand times more, it's, it's being driven by a thousand times more activity per customer. So that, that was why they realized they needed people that could make this site work and make it scale. And that was part of the project that, that I joined for. So I went through the interview process and I joined as a, as a director level. I was one of the management team. Um, and I went to the quarterly offsites. And I went to 27, I think 26 or 27 quarterly offsites in the seven years I was at Netflix. So we'd, we'd have everybody in management come together. And for me, uh, it was, I, I don't need to do an MBA. Like if everyone get people, you go on an MBA, you do the case study on Netflix to explain this thing about Netflix, and, and it's all wrong, because I lived inside an MBA case study for seven years. It's, it was a fantastic experience. I learned a huge amount. I wasn't just learning about the technology I was working on. I saw the entire company, every piece of the company, every quarter was explaining how it worked and the ideas and the things that they were going to do. The other thing, and this is, this is something that uh, people find remarkable, is that Reed Hastings, the CEO, has a one-on-one -on -one with everybody in the management team every quarter. So that's now maybe 200 people. But when I joined, it was maybe 100 people. Right? So that's 200 30-minute one-on-ones a quarter. That's informal conversation that you don't write. It's not writing reports. There's nothing special about it. You just have that. So I had you know, 26 half-hour one-on-ones with Reed. And again, that was an amazing difference from the time compared to eBay, where I couldn't you know, have, 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 and talk to the people I knew because it was a bit out of protocol to skip, skip that many levels of management. So that, those, those things are very interesting. And you know, how can a CEO have enough time to spend having that number of one-on-ones? Well, it's because the decision-making things that you would think the CEO is spending all their time doing have been devolved into the company. People are making their own decisions deep in the company. But how do you know they're making the right decisions? How do you know everything is working well? So he knows, right? Reed knows everything that's happening across the whole company. Every quarter, he touches every piece of the company. And that, that is a very fundamental system. This is getting to the systems for innovation here. It is a system he has for keeping track of what's going on in a company. I, I yet to hear any other company doing that that's bigger than you know, a hand, handful of people at a startup. So I think it was, yeah, I joined in 2007. In 2009, before one of the quarterly business reviews, we get an email from Reed saying, I have an idea. I want to publish our culture. I want to publish a document that has our culture in it. Here's my draft document. Read it, think about it. When we have our quarterly offsite, we will work through the whole document. We will, everyone can redline it, everyone can decide it. We'll form little study groups and discuss it. And, and we'll decide, is it the right thing to do to publish this document? And what should be in it? What should be out of it? What's the best way to talk about it? So we worked through it. And afterwards, he gathered all of the input, he edited it in, and he published this document. So this is my first slide. Right? Okay. 
All right, so I'm not getting. Uh, oops, there we go. All right, so 2009, on SlideShare, we have this document, Freedom and Responsibility Culture. I, I looked, um, it's downloadable as, as a you know, PowerPoint, you can do that too. It now has 11 million views as of last week when I, I checked. 11 million views of this slide deck uh, since it went up in 2009. And Sheryl Sandberg of, of Facebook said, "The may well be the most important document ever to come out of the valley. That's, that's quite amazing for a you know, CEO to publish something and to have that, that, that amount of interest. So what is in this thing, and, and why did we do it? The, the reason that we did it, the initial reason we did it, was related to when I joined Netflix, I was puzzled. What is this culture? We spent a lot of time in the interview discussing it. What we wanted to do was create an external understanding of the culture, because some people were horrified by the culture. <laughs> they found it scary, and they didn't like the idea that, that um, the culture had all this freedom and responsibility in it, and they wanted to just be told what to do, and they would do it, and they wanted to execute on a plan. They didn't want to have the responsibility of figuring out what the plan should be. So by publishing this document, we created uh, a filter outside so that people that read this document thought, that sounds amazing, I need to figure out how that works, would come to us and interview. It became a big attractor for talent. And it also rejected the people that wouldn't survive well or enjoy being at Netflix in the first place. So it acts as a filter. And it also started to create a, a technology brand or, or a culture brand around Netflix. Netflix is a video streaming company but now there's a brand about, well, there's this culture for how they operate. So it's an additional idea that Netflix means to, to people in the valley, in the Silicon Valley. And it helped us as we were trying to compete for hiring the best people in the valley. Nowadays, if you are going to come for interview at Netflix and you haven't read this document, you may as well go home straight away. <laughs> It's the, 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 you're supposed to have read it and understand it and have ideas and questions about it when you turn up for interview. And, and so quest, if we have a phone before the interview, say, by the way, make sure you've read this deck. Right? It's just instant interview fail if you haven't. So what is in this document? Well, there's a nice French quote. I'm not sure it should probably be in French, but I have, this is the slide from the document. If you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people to gather wood divide the work and give orders. Teach them, instead teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. Now, how does this apply to Netflix? Well, what is the purpose of Netflix? And if you think about it, Netflix's purpose is to make TV watching better. That's it, it's very simple. It's the future of television, it's the future of video entertainment. You could say it in a number of different ways, but they have a singular purpose which they've had for their whole existence which is there is problems that we don't like in the experience of trying to entertain ourselves with video. And we want to solve those problems and make it better. At the beginning, the problem was you were rent you, DVDs were hard to find. And you had to go to vi you know, video rental stores. And then they, they were out of stock. And then you, know, you had a late fee because you forgot to take it back. And so the first thing that Netflix had was DVD rental with no late fees. And that was really the innovation that created Netflix as a, as a viable business. And that's what competed with Blockbuster at the time. Now you take that and you go forward a bit and we went, okay, the next problem we want to solve isn't, we're not trying to become a streaming internet company. What we want to do is provide, instead of waiting for the, disc, the, the DVD to be shipped, we want it to be instant. So instant streaming. In fact, unlimited instant streaming. We didn't have very much content, but you could watch it as much as you wanted for no extra money. You could watch anything as many times as you wanted continuously, and you just had to decide you wanted to watch it, push the button, a few seconds later it would start playing. So this was the second innovation that, again, made TV watching better. And now Netflix has now gone through two more revolutions. The, the first one was in TV production. They were finding that they were, Netflix by this time, you know, a few years ago, was so big that it 
was having to pay a lot of money because it had so many customers to license TV shows. I said, well, we don't need to go to the TV studios to license TV shows. We can go to the people that write the TV shows, and we can pay them directly to make a TV show for us that we own the license for. So Netflix started doing original content for TV shows, and they've become very successful. You've seen House of Cards, um, Orange is the New Black. And then when they launch in new countries, they pick up shows from those countries. And I think I may have this wrong, but there's a show made in France uh, called Marseille uh, for Netflix that has yet to come out. It's part of when they launched in France, they did some deals with local production. So there will be a French show. And this is not a show just to be shown in France on Netflix. This is a global show. It will be shown everywhere in the world that Netflix has, but it will be a French show. So this is the kind of thing. They're building a global TV channel. And then the most recent thing they've done is said, you know, it's really hard to license movies. We're going to create ourselves a movie studio. <laughs> They're going to create from scratch a movie studio, and they've already signed up Brad Pitt for a big, big movie for next year. So each time they run into a block, they're trying to make it better, right? So, and another little uh, sort of idea for the, that happens within the culture, whenever we have a staff meeting at Netflix across the company, the first discussion is, what have you watched on TV? You know, have you been to the movies? We talk about content. We talk about the shows and the enjoyment of the, of the vid video, TV, and movie content for maybe five or 10 minutes at the beginning. You go around the table in a staff meeting. Again, it's about inspiring people to think about the content. This is why we are here. It's, we're trying to provide better, better entertainment for people. So think about that as a, as a, as a systemic trick that you can apply um, to have people think about what is the purpose of this company? How have you used it or interacted with it in the last week? So as I was, I've been reading and, and thinking about the way Netflix works, I, I've come in across some more ideas. And one of the ideas, one, one of the interesting books in this is the idea of systems thinking. And this particular book by uh, Jamshid Gara Jedagi. And Systems Thinking, Managing Chaos and Complexity, a Platform for Designing Business Architecture. Now, this book was written in 2011, but he's been working in this field for maybe 20 or 30 years. And there are a huge number of references here. And as I was reading this book, I was thinking, oh, I see. Sort of the way Netflix did things is actually aligned with some of the theories that were developed over decades. And the key, this, this, this phrase, this is a very key thing, purposeful systems. So Netflix is a purposeful system. The purpose of Netflix is very clear. It's to make TV watching better, so that everything organizes around that purpose. But then there's this point here about plurality in three dimensions, plurality of function, structure, and process. What does that mean? Well. Most companies and most organizational systems have a singular focus. They say simplify. They say there is one function. This is the most important thing that this does. You know, the, function, the purpose of a business is to make money or it's to do something else. And everything is subservient to that. When you say you have plurality of function, you say at different times in different contexts, there are different reasons for these things. You don't try and lock everything. You don't oversimplify. You don't simplify down to a single idea. You let it be a plurality of function. Plurality of structure means you don't just have one management hierarchy that everything fits into. There are other hierarchies and there are other structures in the company which are equally valid and which are supported by the systems. Right? So you don't say, this is the management hierarchy. This is the only way it is. And process. Manufacturing processes are built around the idea if you follow the process exactly, you get the same outcome. And if anything goes wrong, you, you, you know, pull the and on cord. If you're a Toyota production system, you fix it. Right? You're trying to manufacture identical things in an extremely standard way. Turns out, though, even with the same inputs, a process will always have variance in its outputs. And once you lock into one process, you stop innovating. So the plurality of process is that you, don't, you try not to have a fixed process. You have a process that's continuously evolving, that is being experimented with, and you accept that there is multiple outcomes. 
and you manage the outcome. You say, this is the set of outcomes I want. I can have any process that gets me there. That becomes a more systemic approach. So the argument that Jamshid makes is that all of the other management systems are a redundant form of the uh, systems development approach, where, every, where all of these things uh, have pluralities. There are multiple variations of them. Now, this is something that when I was joining Netflix, they, they tried, to, tried to describe to me. And the way they put it was, you have to be comfortable with ambiguity to work here. We don't have rules. We don't have processes. You have to figure out what you should be doing. So you have to be comfortable with the fact that it isn't clear what you should be doing all the time. So this is, this is the, you know, another slide from the deck. With the right people, instead of having this culture of I follow the process, therefore I won't get fired, um, I have a culture of creativity, self-discipline, freedom, and responsibility. The whole of Netflix is more innovative. Everybody at Netflix is more innovative than most research labs because the, everyone has this freedom to decide how to best operate. It's a, very, it's a very powerful culture. So I do talks at conferences, and I do talks at a, a sort of CIO, CTO summits. And I gave a presentation once, and afterwards somebody said, well, this is all very wonderful, but we can't copy Netflix because we don't have people. We don't have these superstar programmers and developers that you have. And I looked around the room, and I looked at the nameplates of the companies, and I said, we hired them from you. <laughs> you do have these people, and you're getting in their way, <laughs> and you're annoying them, and you make them want to leave, and some of them end up at Netflix, where we get out of their way. And if you take a, a really good engineer, and you put them in a system that gets in their way, maybe they release one third of their, their potential. If you get that engineer at Netflix and the system magnifies their efforts and pulls them into doing more and more cool things, maybe they do three times their potential. Maybe sometimes there's a difference of 10 times the output for the same engineer. So you think you don't have these people. Look inside your own organizations. Find the people that are a little restless that, that, that are looking for a challenge. It, it, it's very hard to do this. The, the distinguished engineer system at, at Sun Microsystems that I was in was, a, was one attempt to do that, and that may work. But figuring out how to take, quite often the best people you have are the people who are most overworked. They're the people everyone goes to to solve a problem. When the, when the website goes down, it's the one person that can fix it. They are usually so busy that they're burnt out. Right. So this is the hard thing. You have to take those people out of production. You have to give them their freedom. You have to say, no one is al you're allowed to say no to everybody now. You get to go, and you get to decide what you want to spend your time on. And you get to teach other people and mentor and work on different things. And your job is no longer to be the central point, the, the, the bottleneck in, in the, for getting everything done and fixing everything. Your job is to be a able to think and reorganize and come up with new ideas. And that is a very hard transition to make, because this is the best people. and Everyone else will scream, if you take this person out, uh, you know, something will stop working. Right? Uh, there's a book called The Phoenix Project uh, by, by Gene Kim. You, you should maybe, it's a novel about a company that's having problems. And there's a character in this called Brent. Brent is this person. Right? He, he's the, person who, the only person that can fix everything. So this, these are the actual aspects of the culture. Values are what we value. So this, was, this is a bit more about having, rather than having empty, an empty set of values, you can list some very nice culture uh, aspirations for a company. And the example in the culture deck is Enron. Enron has these great things, and they were actually not doing them. They were doing all kinds of, almost the opposite. Um, so you exhibit these values. As you are working at the company, you are seen to be uh, doing these things. And then there's high performance, really finding only high performance people that can fit in this organization, giving them freedom, responsibility. The management approach, rather than micromanaging, your job as a manager is to give people context rather than control them. If somebody messes up, there's three reasons why they might mess up. They might have been incompetent, you know, or had bad judgment, that's one reason they may have been given the wrong context. So they did a perfectly valid thing to do 
with the information they had, but they didn't have the right information. It's their manager's job to make sure they have the context, they have the right information. And given the right information and a, you know, somebody with good judgment, then it comes down to, were you able to execute? So sometimes there's failures of execution. There wasn't time, the resources weren't there, something else broke, or you, were just, you just didn't know how to do something. Yeah, that, you, can le you can learn how to avoid failures of execution. It's much harder to learn to avoid failures of judgment. The company is organized as this highly aligned, loosely coupled system. I'll talk a bit more about that later. And then they also pay top of the market because you want the very best people and you want to hold them onto them. I'll mention a little bit about that in a few minutes. So Netflix isn't the only company that has a culture deck. One of the uh, interesting phenomenon is other people have said, we should have a culture deck. We'll put our culture deck on SlideShare, and we're going to stay what we want to do because, because of it. And Nordstrom, this is more than a 100-year-old company. They, they sell clothes. Yeah. Um, it's it's uh, one of my wife's favorite companies. They have a, they, they, you can take anything back. They have, a, they have a service oriented culture where they want to give the best service in retail for uh, you know, high end clothes and, and uh, things like that. So um, in their culture day, this is the, no, the technology team. They have really just one rule, use good judgment in all situations. And if you look at the Netflix culture deck, the first thing of the first value is judgment. And this really comes down to if you're creating a system and you're an actor in this system, then the only thing you have to guide yourself is your judgment in the system. If you don't have good judgment, then there are no rules to follow. You may do the wrong thing. So, so this comes down to being um, you know, the sort of the good actor rather than the bad actor in the system. If somebody is, is showing bad behavior in a good system, you have to remove them from the system. So there's a very clear idea here that probably the one reason for, fail for somebody failing and leaving Netflix is, is bad judgment. Let's talk a bit about the, the uh, system they have for rewarding people. And this, this is, again, a, a very unusual system. I've seen very few people uh, try to do this. All compensation is fully vested. What does that mean? It means that... You get, a, you get paid, there are no bonuses. Right? When I was at eBay, everyone that leaves eBay leaves in April. Why is this? Well, because you get your annual bonuses every quarter, and half of it's held back to be the, the you know, it's a quarterly bonus and an annual bonus, and you get paid a quarter after the year ends. So in, in around March, or, or the first paycheck, in end of March, 1st of April, you get your annual bonus for the previous year. And then you leave. <laughs> Right? Because that's the best time to leave. Otherwise, you get this bonus that you're building up you won't get. Right? So that means that uh, there's this weird distortion in the system. What happens at Netflix, there's no bonus scheme. You just pay everybody up front. Here it is. We take whatever you would have got another company plus the bonus. We just say that's your total compensation. Your bonus is that you're still here next year working. Right? There's no additional bonus in the system. Um, you assume that everyone is competent and working at their best rate. If somebody is, does less well, maybe you should replace them with somebody that would be, more, be better. So there's no bonus. There's no reason to, if, if you want to lay someone off, you lay them off, they leave with everything. They're not waiting for a bonus. There's, oh, we'll keep you on for a few months so you can get your bonus. We don't have this kind of distortion in the system. The other, the other thing is the stock plan, the stock option plan. And this is a very, very unusual plan. Well, the way pay is done. Let's talk about that first. Once a year, there is a mark to market for salaries, which means that if you're an engineer, we look at the other engineers that were hired maybe in the last six months. How much did we have to pay to hire them in the current market? And the Bay Area is a very hot market. How much do we have to make them? Who are the comparable people? You mark the internal people, the people that were there already, to equivalent pay to the people you've just hired. So you create a benchmark for the current pay for this type of skill set, and you mark to that. So your pay is not based on how well you did how you're, it, you know, as, a, as an engineer or, or you know, success of a project. It's based what is the market value if you were to leave and go somewhere else today what, what could you get? We'll pay you that now, every year, right? 
So that means you don't get these little 4% spread around everybody kind of annual pay rises where you get behind and after a few years you have to leave to, to get what you're really worth. That doesn't happen. So it's marked up. Now, you can become more valuable. And one of the things, I was running the open source program for Netflix. I helped sort of create and run what is now 55 projects on GitHub. And some of the engineers realized that, you know, one, they were cloud experts with maybe now four or five years' experience of cloud. This is a very valuable skill. And once they'd open sourced a project on GitHub with their name on it and written the blog post about it, they were now visible. And people started asking them, hey, do you want to come and work for us? So their value in the market increased because, one, they're cloud specialists, and two, they have open source projects. And then the more successful the projects, the more demand. So they realized, you know, I like to have an open source project. This makes me more valuable. And at the end of the year, you get a big pay rise because now you're being com compared with people we were hiring who already had open source projects and, and were cloud experts. So this, this is an internal way by developing your internal skill sets into a very high value area, you get paid more for that. So that, that's the part of the compensation scheme. So the other part of the scheme is, is even more strange. The, the stock option scheme. Uh, why would I be talking about a stock option scheme? Because it's, I, I've never heard anyone else do this. Normally, there's two reasons to give you stock options. One is to share in the future value of the company as it gets better. So that's great. The other one is to lock you in with handcuffs and say, if you leave, you don't get this value. Netflix has one where if you leave, you keep everything. All of the stocks vest the same day. You could you get issued some stock options. You could sell them tomorrow. Right. You get them at the current price, so that you know you probably the price has to move a bit before it's worth selling them, and you get a ten-year option. So you have ten years to sell these stock options. And this is an interesting thing. Part of one of the problems with this of the industry stock analysts don't understand the Netflix stock scheme, and it's it's public. It's not a secret. They just don't understand it. <laughs> So they see all kinds of strange things happening. Um, but on the first day of every month, you get some shares. And you can put up to 50% of your salary into the stock plan. And then what's left is what's reported for income, income tax, whatever. So you can, you can vary your, your actual take-home pay every year by playing with this percentage and have the percentage that goes into the stock plan. So it's a, a very interesting system. People have said it's very expensive to run, but it has, has this extremely high payback for a volatile stock that's doing well. And then the other thing is that it doesn't lock you in. Because if you say, you know, this person, we no longer need them at the company. We should let them go. They take all their stock. There's no, they're not waiting for a bonus. They can, you can just have them leave the same day. There's no reason not to. Right? And so it's easy to, it makes it easy to get rid of people that don't want to be there or, or are failing or, or for whatever reason. And it means that there is this test that all managers have that's, that is that you should actively want, you would fight to keep everyone on your team. If there is somebody on your team and you say, I wouldn't fight to keep that person, you should fire them immediately and hire somebody that you would fight to keep. That's the test. And it's a very strong test and we really try and practice that. So, going back to uh, Jamshid again. An organization success is the product of the interactions amongst these five basic processes of throughput, usually making money, decision making, learning and control, the membership, and conflict management. These various aspects, and there's a lot more detail in this book about how to think about these and how to build a system that can manage these. Now, there's another, looking at what's happening in this space, okay, there's the Netflix example, there are a number of other companies, and the, and the company that was mentioned uh, yesterday by Aaron is Zappos, and I, I'd already sort of decided to talk about them a little bit. I have a friend who is very into holacracy. He's running his own company. He's, he's extremely enthusiastic about it. Um, and if you look at holacracy, it's, it takes a lot of the ideas and the systems that Netflix has built and is using, and then it also adds a few, it goes further. But this, this is one of the key ideas. If people have an authority in the system, people start having this idea that if this was my company, what would I do? There is a sense of belonging, a sense of responsibility. This is the responsibility part. You're free to make decisions, and you are now responsible to it. For, for your, you feel responsible for the whole company. And 
there's this shift from personal leadership to constitutionally derived power. And this is a little bit like, I mean, we've been, I, we went to Versailles, we've been to the Louvre, we see all of these things, the, the, the changes that have happened in, in France in the last few hundred years. This is a little bit like the king abdicating <laughs> and saying, you know, I'm gonna go to holacracy. The CEO abdicates their power into a constitution and just become, and becomes a prime minister. And now you have the role of prime minister, which anyone can inhabit, which is what has the power. And this is the difference between a typical company hierarchy, which is more like a, a kingdom, and the holacracy system, which is more like a constitutional democracy, where there are roles that have power. And the decisions are made by the roles. You don't have to ask everybody for input to do something. The role makes the input. They ask for input, but they make the decision. It's very clear. And people move around between the roles. And there's also a, a governance process whereby everybody comes together to decide what roles should exist and what power should they have, which is a bit like making laws and uh, you know, designing the systems of government. So it's a very interesting system. It goes quite a bit further than Netflix, but if you want to look at sort of the distillation of this, the Holacracy book, I think, is an interesting one to read to get some good ideas. So to summarize what Netflix has done, they found that as they grow as a company, and now they have uh, maybe one or 2,000 people total in the company as, as salaried employees, they, they minimize rules by growing, by having better and better people and by making sure that uh, the systems are used to create the rules. As, as people try to copy Netflix, one of the problems they have is they're copying the artifacts. They're copying what looks like the processes that Netflix is operating on, but those processes are artifacts of the system. You have to go deeper and understand the systems that create these processes, because the processes are mutating and they're adapting, and if you copy a process, you're fixing it in time. Like if you write down a process, you're freezing it, and then the, system, the world underneath changes, and that process is now making you do the wrong thing over and over again. So we're in a much more fluid world. We're not trying to you know, stab, stamp widgets out of a manufacturing product line. We're trying to innovate and create systems that uh, interact with the real world. And this is the point. Flexibility is more important than efficiency. If you're trying to make, you know, one, one inch long wood screws, then you need to make them very efficiently. They make the millions of them, they should all be exactly the same. Nuts and bolts, things like that. But if what you're trying to do is build a company which can grow and take over the world and in its space, because if you think, you know, how many people in the world want to like watching TV and movies? You know, there are seven billion people in the world, a few billion, probably, you know, across all the different cultures. So how many of them are on the internet? That's like a few billion. How many are on broadband? It's maybe a billion or so right now. Um, so Netflix's current addressable market is maybe a billion people, you know, as it goes global. Eventually, this will probably be several billion people for just doing what the one product they have now, right? They currently have 62 million customers, I think. So lots of upside. So the flexibility of how do you reach those, the, the billion customers is, is interesting. Now I'm talk a little bit about the technology side. Um, I was working on the, the, the Netflix um, sort of migration to cloud. And back in 2006, this, this was uh, something that um, Werner Vogels was talking about, that developers were building products and then they were running them in production as well. And this, was the, this, this is now, I think, called DevOps uh, by most people. There was two flavors of DevOps, but the way that Netflix approached it was to have the developers running, owning their code in production. So we built a system that was supported everybody doing that. It means that you can make multiple changes per day, and you know, the person that knows the current state of the production system is the developer that's changing it. So there is no silos, there are no meetings, there are no tickets to file, and everybody owns everything all the way through. So it puts the developers on call. And how do you get developers on call? Because they say, I didn't become a developer to be on call. Uh, quite often a response. Well, the, what you do is you get the VP of engineering that runs development, you put him on call or her on call and you put all of the directors on call, and you put all of the managers on call, 
And then you put the, end, the developers on call and you say, if you don't pick up the phone when you know, the system breaks at 3 a.m. like it always does, the next person in the call tree is your manager. And if they don't pick up the phone, it works its way up. So now you have a system <laughs> which causes people to, one, write code that doesn't break at 3 a.m. And it turns out developers are very good at writing code that doesn't break when they're on call. It's a very powerful feedback loop. And the other thing you find is that people don't like to wake up their superiors, their management chain, because they screwed up. <laughs> right? So there's a very strong incentive to take this and do it right. So I'm running out of time here. Um, there's, there's also a lot, I've written a lot of, about microservices. If you may be, you know, from the technology side, there are lots of presentations on SlideShare that I've made. Uh, and I was at a DevOps Days in Amsterdam last week giving a talk to um, Conway's Law basically says that organizations will build software and systems and design systems that map to the structure of the organization. And what we found is that in order to create systems with the architecture we want, we have to create organizations with that structure. And you create these autonomous teams that create a piece of functionality of your product are the people that create a microservice or a series of microservices, and they operate it. They develop it. They decide what it should do. They develop it, and they operate it. OK. We've got just two more slides. So this one is actually from another, another area, another really interesting book, uh, Dil The Dilbert Cartoonist. So maybe Dilbert's a funny cartoon about workplace. Uh, Scott Adams wrote a really interesting book, How to Fail Almost Everything and Still Win Big, about how to create systems for your personal life particularly, and in the systems he has for business. It's, it's, a, it's a very deeply, deeply thought book. Um, and the problem with goals is that, let's say I have a goal, and I don't meet my goal, I'm unhappy, because I didn't meet my goal. And if I go right past my goal, I'm unhappy because I maybe set the goal too low. Right? So goals are things which are, you know, if you hit it exactly, you're suspicious as well, you probably are sandbagging, you shouldn't, you know, you've manufactured your result. A system just says, I just wish to be better, and I will be as good as I can be, but there won't be a specific goal. And the, the idea he has is just create, create systems for creating accidental, happy, accidental outcomes. You're putting yourself in the way of luck, and you make yourself happier in the long run. Okay, so I'm going to leave you with, with this thought. We see the world is increasingly more complex and chaotic because we are, have inadequate concepts to explain it. Right. We're trying to map fixed hierarchies and the single views of the world to a complicated world. And once you understand these pluralities and the systems that raise thinking, now what looks like complex and chaotic behavior, emergent systems and complex adaptive systems behavior, now there are simple rules. You know, a fractal is incredibly complicated, but it's an extremely simple formula. So it's those kinds of underlying, understanding those underlying things is important. So that, that's what I have, hopefully time for a question or two.